So welcome back to episode 24 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which will be our very first young researcher session. As usual, we would like to have your questions. Please send us your questions by email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. Today, it's going to be different. We're going to have three short talks and we will do a short question session after each of those talks. If we don't have time to answer all of your questions, please join us in the Zoom session at the very end. I will post the Zoom link in the YouTube chat window um, at the end of the, uh, the session. Also note that there's a 30 second time delay between what we're doing and what you're seeing on YouTube. And with that, uh, without much further ado, um, our very first speaker today will be Federica Zurace from Trieste. And Federica, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for uh, accepting me as a speaker. So let me share my screen now. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the quantum simulation of lattice gauge theories with with Rydberg atoms, and uh, I want to start with some some motivation. So why are we interested in this problem? And uh, the the reason is that as we also learned from other uh, seminars in the series, uh, experiments and different experimental platforms have reached a high degree of control and tunability of quantum systems. And uh, this has, uh, has motivated the idea of using quantum simulator for studying strongly correlated matter. And, and these quantum simulators are, are especially useful for studying the time evolution of many particle quantum systems and, and highly entangled states of matter. So the possibility of studying the, the real-time dynamics offers very interesting perspective for, uh, for high energy physics as well. Uh, because uh, uh, because of uh, interest for for scattering problems, for example, and the the hope is that these quantum simulators could one day be able to overcome the limitations of experiments, which uh, typically require very uh, large facilities, and also of classical computation, which um, usually uh, relies on, on Monte Carlo simulations, uh, which are not suitable for for real-time dynamics. And so uh, for this reason, it is uh, it's interesting to try and understand if quantum simulators can be used for simulating lattice gauge theories. So here are some reference for some reviews. And uh, so first of all, uh, let me tell you what, what we mean with gauge theories and in particular, what we mean with gauge fields. Because there are two uh, types of, of gauge fields that one can one can uh, reproduce in an experiment. Um, one are static gauge fields. So um, to understand what static gauge fields are, uh, you can just think of a particle that hops in a two-dimensional lattice. And if the, um, the phases of the, I mean, if the hopping are, are uh, complex, then uh, this particle can acquire a phase when it hops around the plaquette. And this phase, uh, represents uh, um, uh, the effect of a, of a magnetic flux that, that, that threads the, the plaquette. And this kind of gauge fields are static gauge fields that have been, uh, um, have been implemented in, in various experiments series, for example, one uh, that was done at, at Lance in Florence. And uh, these gauge fields, however, are, are experimental parameters that you control externally. Uh, while the, the ones that we are interested in are dynamical gauge fields, uh, which means that they are additional degrees of freedom, so uh, quantum mechanical degrees of freedom also with the Hilbert space, uh, and, they, and they reside on the links of the lattice. And this kind of models uh, uh, can be found in, in different contexts, for example, in, in condensed matter when you study frustrated magnets, uh, in quantum computing, because uh, Historic code is at the two lattice gauge theory, and as I was already mentioned, also in, in high energy physics. Uh, but uh, while they are ubiquitous in physics, um, it is uh, very difficult to engineer them in, in a controlled way. And the reason is that uh, you, you typically need to, to, um, uh, to control complex many body interaction, like these uh, four body terms. 
Uh, and at the same time, uh, you need to enforce uh, some, some local symmetries, the uh, gauge symmetries. And so for this reason, this is very, very challenging for experiments. And um, there was uh, one first experiment that was done um, with, with trapped ions uh, in, in, in Innsbruck. Um, but the, the problem is uh, uh, scaling this kind of experiments to very large system sizes. So. So far, there was no evidence that atomic systems can really simulate gauge theories at large scale. And, and so what we did uh, um, in our work was to, to show how this, uh, this was done. So uh, a U1 gauge theory in one plus one dimension was, was simulated, uh, uh, exploiting the dynamics induced by Rydberg interaction. Uh, so with, with 51 Rydberg atoms. So uh, here is the outline for the, the rest of my talk. I will first introduce the model and um, first the FSS model, which describes uh, the dynamics of this rebirth excitation, and then uh, the, the quantum link model, that is the gauge theories that we want to simulate. Uh, and then I, I will um, talk about the dynamics. So first uh, I will describe what was observing the experiments, and then I will give the interpretation uh, using these uh, case theories. Okay, so this is a sketch of the of the experiment that was done in Harvard in, in Lukin's group. And um, so the, there was this chain of, uh, uh, of atoms trapped in optical tweezers. And uh, you can think of each atom as a two-level system uh, that can be excited to from the ground state to uh, Rydberg excited state with this uh, radio frequency omega. So uh, this delta is, is the tuning of the laser. This nj is uh, is one if if the the, the atom j is uh, in the excited state and zero if it's in the ground state. And this v is just the uh, interaction between uh, Rydberg excitations. This v uh, d decays uh, as one over r to the six with distance, so it d decays very fast. And, and they were working in the regime where, where uh, the interaction between nearest neighbor was, was very large. And so this model can, can be uh, simplified in this way. One can neglect uh, uh, longer range interaction and only take into account interaction between nearest neighbors by uh, enforcing this constraint. So saying that to uh, Rydberg excitation cannot sit on, uh, on neighboring sites because this requires uh, uh, too large energy. And this model was studied for, uh, for different reasons. Uh, for, I mean, it's, it has a very interesting phase diagram and also it's non-equilibrium dynamics is, is, is very interesting. For example, quantum scars uh, um, have, have been uh, found there for the first time. Uh, and I will not talk about this. I will just uh, focus on uh, on the gauge theory, uh, on the relation with the gauge theory. Okay, so uh, th this is the now the, the gauge theory that we uh, we studied. So uh, first of all, we had uh, fermionic matter. So these uh, uh, phi are, are um, fermionic operators on uh, sites of uh, I and J, and they satisfy the usual anti-commutation relation. Uh, we use uh, so-called uh, um, staggered fermions, which means that on even sites, uh, unoccupied uh, fermionic site is uh, a positrons, and on odd sites, an, a hole uh, represents an electrons. And the other uh, uh, states are just uh, uh, absence of, of charge. And uh, together with, with the okay, matter, uh, as I said, we need some degrees of freedom that live on, on the links. And so we define these two operators, E and U. E is the electric field and the U is called the parallel transporter. And uh, we work with this uh, representation. So uh, the electric field and the parallel transporter are represented by spin one alpha operator, SC and S plus. And uh, I will use this uh, graphical notation that uh, the positive electric field will be uh, an arrow going to the right, and the negative electric field will be an arrow going to the to the left. And and together with this, we, we of course we need the, 
the, the gauge symmetry. So uh, the local symmetry, and these are so, so we need to define some uh, uh, local uh, generator, this uh, G J, and uh, you see they they are the difference between the electric field going out of side J minus the minus the electric field coming into side J. Uh, minus this quantity, which is defined in such a way that it's plus one for the positron, minus one for the electrons, and zero in all the other cases. So this means that this gj is the difference between the electric flux by j and the charge. So um, fr from this, you see that imposing Gauss law simply means that we have to restrict to the states which satisfy uh this equality so where g is, is zero and and of course this has to be a symmetry so it has to commute with, with the hamiltonian uh okay so i don't uh, i'm not going to to uh introduce the hamiltonian and, and the mapping in details because i don't have time but i just want to uh tell you about the general idea so on one side we had this uh, u1 lattice gauge theory constrained by Gauss law which means that we don't allow this kind of, uh, of violations where the charge is different from, from the flux. And we also we, we, uh, restrict to a subspace of the total inner space. And on the other side, we had um, a model for Rydberg atoms that was constrained by Rydberg blockade, which means that uh, two uh, Rydberg excitation cannot be on neighboring sites. So while these two models, they had nothing to do, uh, I mean, the, the unconstrained models, they had nothing uh, uh, in common. Uh, if you uh, restrict them to the, this constrained space, you can see that there is actually uh, an exact mapping between the two, both at the level of states and at the level of, uh, of Hamiltonians. And so what we did was to use this, uh, this observation to uh, understand the dynamics. So in, in the experiment, what they prepared was an initial state where there was a, a, a Rydberg excitation on every even site, and they let it evolve in time. And this oscillation between this state and the state where the, the excitations were on the, on the odd sites. So, uh, okay, so how, how can we uh, interpret this? Well, if you use the, the mapping to the gauge theory, you see that the initial state it's just a state with no uh, charges and constant electric field positive. And the other state is, is another state with no, no charges and negative electric field. And, and in between, you can go from this state to the other uh, by creation and annihilation of electron positron pairs. So these kind of oscillations that we're observing in the experiment uh, they, are, they can be interpreted uh, as plasma oscillations of, of, the, of the electric field. Okay, so uh, to, to summarize what I showed you today, uh, so uh, I showed that a U1 lattice gauge theory is, uh, is naturally realized in Rydberg atom arrays, and was <laughs> realized in Rydberg atom array. And um, okay, and I showed you how this could give could be used to give an interpretation to the dynamics uh, uh, observed. Also, I didn't have time to, to discuss this, but uh, we, we, uh, we showed this in the paper that uh, one can also uh, study experimentally the dynamics of particle and antiparticle pairs and, and confinement. And uh, let, let me also mention that we are now working uh, also in the problem of the scattering of mesons and quantum simulations. Um, other, other perspective for the future are to extend this to, to more complicated models, so to a non-abelian uh, gauge theory, and also to, to higher dimensionality. So uh, let me now thank the, the, my collaborators, uh, Paolo, Giuliano, Alessio, Andrea, and Marcello. And uh, I thank you for your attention. So thank you, Federica, for this very uh, nice uh, talk. Uh, we have some uh, questions for you. Uh, 
so the first one is saying that it's really nice to see the possibility to realize uh, this particular lattice gauge theory in experiments. Uh, could you say more about which classes of lattice gauge theory we already know how to implement in the experiment? How close we are to the theories that you mentioned at the beginning that arise, for example, for frustrated magnets or in high energy physics? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so the, the, the ones that were uh, actually uh, realized in experiments uh, are so far uh, uh, U1 uh, lattice gauge theories in, in one plus one dimension, both of them. So the, the, the one I first uh, mentioned with trapped ions and this one I discussed today. Uh, and there are, there are, of course, uh, uh, many proposals. So, uh, I mean, the, of course, the, the goal is, is probably to, to uh, one day be able to simulate uh, quantum chromodynamics uh, so in three plus one dimension. So this means that, uh, but first of all, uh, one, one should try to understand how to do these non-abelian uh, grade groups. Uh, and there are some, some proposals for, for, for this. And another thing is, is going to, to three dimension, which is uh, also very, very challenging, but yeah, so far for, for experiment, I mean, there are many proposals, but experimental uh, implementation are still uh, not, not many. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We have also a question from uh, Bill, Bill Phillips for you. So he's asking what is important about Freiberg atoms for simulating dynamic gauge field that is absent in, for example, contact interaction? It is between contact a longer ray interaction, the difference? Okay, so, well, in, in this case, uh, we are not really exploiting the fact that you have long range interactions because what, what we are using uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, are, are the nearest neighbor interactions that are very large. So we are using the fact that, that you have a very, uh, very different uh, energy scales. So the, 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 the energy scale for the nearest neighbor interaction, which is much, much larger than, than the other, um, uh, the, the other energy scales in, in, the, in the model. And, and this is, uh, uh, and, and this effectively gives a, a constraint. So this idea of, uh, of realizing uh, uh, a gauge symmetry by imposing some, some constraints could maybe uh, be done also in other kind of, uh, of experiments. But uh, I mean, this is something that really depends uh, on, on the platform and then this has to be specific for the model that one wants to implement. So, uh, and th th there is some ingredients that you would ask to experimental physicists in order to implement some particular part of your gauge, gauge field theory that you would like to have. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, one, one, so for example, yes, in, in, in this case, as I said, one, one thing is that the fact that one can have these, uh, uh, different energy scales and, and, and this uh, is something that in some way protects from, from violations of, of, the, of, the, um, of the gauge symmetry. But in, in, in general, uh, uh, I think the, the big uh, challenge now is, is also to go to, to more than one dimension. And of course, uh, this, uh, I mean, this requires actually both uh, experimentalists and theorists to, to find ways of, of doing this. So, yeah, I think, I mean, um, from my point of view, I think going to, to, to a more dimension is something else. It would be very, very interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's time to uh, switch to the next uh, speaker. Uh, let the stage to Sebastian to introduce him. Well, thank you very much also from my side, Federica. Very nice talk. Uh, let's uh, switch to our second talk. This session is going to be given by Gal Ness from Haifa. Uh, Gal, if you want to uh, share your slides, and please feel free to get started right away. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian, for uh, the opportunity to present here. And thank you all for watching. My name is Gal Ness, and today I will briefly tell you about a recent uh, study 
of polar onto molecule transition in highly imbalanced Fermi gas. Um, so first I'd like to introduce my team. So I'm from your Afsagil group at the Technion and especially acknowledge Kostya Shkedov who co-worked with me on the experimental side of this work. I'm also very glad for a great collaboration we had with the group of Richard Schmidt from MPQ and particularly Oriana Diesel and Jonas van Michewski who carried out the theoretical calculation. So what are these polarons and why are they so interesting? In general, polarons are these impurities that we find in highly imbalanced two component systems. And we actually find them in platera of uh, physical uh, systems from, of course, cold atoms, but also semiconductors high to high TC conductors, fermionic helium, and even neutron stars. And they offer us the simplest case study for strongly interacting matter. Let's see what we mean by that. So if you consider a simple impurity, fermionic impurity in a surrounding Fermi C, so as long as there is no interaction, we have just a free particle. But then when you introduce a weak attractive interaction, you find that the impurity is dressed by the majority Fermi C and actually forming a quasi particle named polaron. This uh, uh, distortion of the Fermi C is uh, this quasi particle is just like a regular particle. It has this narrow energy uh, dispersion relation, just that some of its properties are renormalized. However, where you, when you even increase the uh, interaction further, you find that the impurity is energetically favorable to bind one of the majority atoms and form a molecule. This molecule is also then dressed by the rest of the majority atoms, so it's another quasi particle. But this molecule, molecular quasi particle, is bosonic because it's made of two fermions. Uh, in contrast to the fermionic polaron, which is just an adiabatic continuation of the free particle case. So we have these two very distinct quasi particles, and between them we have the uh, first order polaron to molecule transition, at least in the limit of single uh, impurity, as we see here. So this is an FRG calculation by Schmidt and Ernst. And here we see the interaction uh, strength, one over KFA, and we see the polar one energy in red and the molecular one in blue. And we see that they're both crossed at about 0 0.9, where we anticipate a first order transition as was first predicted by a uh, Prokofiev and Tristanov. Now, this prediction holds, for, uh, of course, for the single impurity limit at zero temperature. And it is more interesting to ask what will happen in the limit of many impurities where the co different quantum statistics of these both quasi-particles can play a role. Now, a, a, the signature or one manifestation of this first order transition is actually a jump in the quasi-particle weight. The quasi-particle weight measures to what extent we can describe the state as a fermionic particle. And we see that at the transition, it features a sharp jump, a sharp discontinuity from some finite value to zero where the polaronic branch is no longer populated. And uh, this, the, as this the Fermi polaron problem is very interesting, many experiments have done to study its properties in the last decade, uh, yet none of which observed a sharp jump in the quasi-particle weight, which was measured among other observables. And then the question arises whether there is a sharp jump in, in the realistic experimental limit of many impurities. And if there isn't, why? What, what drives the transition from being sharp? So in order to answer these questions and in order to extract precisely additional observables of the Fermi polaron, we developed a, a, an experimental technique called high sensitivity Raman spectroscopy with which uh, we studied this problem. And we accompanied this technique by advanced theoretical calculation that took into account many impurities at finite temperature. With, this, with that in hand, we found that finite impurity concentration is driving the, uh, the transition from being uh, to being smooth, so it uh, avoid the sharp transition, and that finite temperature actually even uh, takes it even further and uh, enhances this effect. Interestingly, we see that around the transition, we have this uh, uh, coexistent regime where polarons and molecules, quasi-particles, live together. 
But most importantly, is this first point that it's the bare quantum statistics, the finite concentration of impurities that result in smooth transition, because that means that in any realistic experimental system, we will find a smooth transition because there are many impurities. Okay, now let me describe the avant-garde experimental tool that we developed, which is Raman spectroscopy uh, of high sensitivity. So in general, what do we mean when we say spectroscopy is that we want to study this, um, this branch of, uh, of the impurity, and we do it by outcoupling atoms from it into some free, uh, some free state. And what we actually do is just measure the number of atoms we will manage to outcouple as a function of the detuning, of the difference between the energy of this blue photon and the bare transition. So this is how it looks like. We scan the detuning. We uh, arrive at some uh, number of atoms. And an important aspect of this specific spectroscopy that we are using here is the fact that we use Raman transition. Now, what's so unique about Raman transition so if we consider the conventional arc spectroscopy, the photon momentum is negligible. However, when you do Raman transition, you gain a significant momentum imprint by the transition itself. And this leads, when you write the energy momentum conservation equation, equations to a linear relation between the detuning omega and the initial momentum of the particle Kz in the axial direction. Now, with this at hand, it means that the Raman transition is velocity selective and we can use it to detect the underlying momentum distributions of the particles. So this specific uh, equation stands for the bare mass or for weakly or non-interacting particles, but a simple generalization also holds for non-unity effective mass, so for quasi-particles, as long as their uh, uh, dispersion branch is, is, uh, is narrow. Now, let's keep to this example of weakly interacting fermions and see some experimental result. So here we scan the detuning, already translated to units of momentum, and measure the number of atoms, uh, which we know, of course. And you can see this beautiful agreement between the Raman spectrum and this line, which represent a one-dimensional momentum distribution due to bare Fermi-Dirac statistics. So, we see this correspondence. This is actually a very nice thermometry measurement because it enables us to extract the temperature, the condition of the gas without even letting it expand. So this is an in situ measurement. You don't need time of flight in order to achieve uh, such uh, uh, thermometry of your gas. And what's more important here is notice the log scale of the y-axis, which uh, demonstrates actually the wide dynamic range that we have in this measurement. And this wide dynamic range is crucial, or the high sensitivity at the at, uh, low number of atoms is crucial in the impurity problem because we inherently deal with low signals, with small number of atoms because they are impurity. Um, so the way we get this kind of uh, high sensitivity is by taking these transferred atoms and put them into a third state, which is magnetically trappable. And then we switch on a magnetic trap, keep only the transferred atoms, and can count the fluorescence very precisely, ending up with being able to resolve a single atom resolution level at the tails of the spectrum. So this is the tool that we developed. And now we aim to apply this tool to the problem of the ferrum polaron, so highly imbalanced, strongly interacting gas. And here you can see a summary of the data. So this is the interaction uh, scale. And here you see the two photon detuning. The color map stands for the transmission probability. So in fact, each vertical cut in this diagram represents a Raman spectrum. And we can see that in the BCS side of weak interactions, we have a very picky behavior that gets smooth, that gets broader and broader as we go towards the BC side. Now, to better understand it, let's take actual cuts here. So here at the BCS limit, we see this very symmetric peak. This peak is such uh, as it is because it actually represents the momentum distribution of the underlying polarons. So this is direct probe of the momentum distributions of the polaron. And as we increase the interaction going towards the unitarity, we see a tail that starts to develop. If we increase the interaction even further, so here at the BC side, we see that the tail already dominates the spectra. 
So we have this change in behavior and development of this tail, which is attributed to the contribution of both molecules and incoherent part of the polaron. And uh, what you can also see here is this shift of the peak position. You can also see it here. And because the Raman spectra at the polaronic site directly represents the momentum distribution of polaron, the peak can give us a direct probe of the zero momentum polaron energy. So just by taking the peak position, we can see the polaron energy here, and we uh, observe that it has an excellent agreement with the polaron energy predicted by the Chevy ansatz. We can also ext extract the binding energy of the uh, molecules effectively by feeding uh, the spectrum to pair dissociation functional. But most importantly, we can fit each spectrum into two contributions. One contribution is the symmetric part owing to the coherent polaron, and this is just a momentum distribution. And the other asymmetric part, this is the pair dissociation spectrum from the incoherent part and pairs. Now, if we take the weight of this first part, this is just a many body generalization of the quasi particle weight that we discussed earlier. And we can observe it has a very smooth gradual decrease all along the interaction scale that of course, if we compare it to the single impurity prediction at zero temperature, we see a qualitative difference between the two. The data did, does not feature any kind of this jump, even when we take the model and do a, a, a trap averaging of it. However, when you come with a model at finite impurity density and temperature, we find that it managed to capture the, uh, the experimental, the realist, the real uh, behavior that observed in experiments. So this is the main result of uh, this work. And uh, I'd like to uh, spend my last slide explaining a bit about the theoretical model that we used. So this is a calculation done uh, by our MPQ colleagues. And what they did was to take the polaron and molecule wave function ansatz and actually populate them according to the uh, to their quantum statistics at finite temperature, arriving at the following insight with which I will finish. So here we see the case of single impurity at zero temperature. Uh, here we see a sharp abrupt jump between the two ground states. But as long as you introduce finite impurity, we see that the fermionic statistics of the polarons already drives the transition to be smooth, already blurs the transition. And when you introduce finite temperature, it only enhances the, the smoothness even further. But also you can see here the coexistence, but most importantly, this the, the smooth uh, transition is a result of the finite impurity density. And as such, we can conclude that we will find such a smooth transition and a coexistence in any experimental realization where we have finite impurity density. Uh, for that, we developed the high sensitivity Raman spectroscopy technique that enabled us to extract the momentum distribution of polarons and distinguish it robustly from the background signal. And next, we aim to use these techniques in order to study the repulsive polaron and also to reverse the process and use the Raman spectroscopy to inject impurities at a desirable uh, momentum. So with that, I'll refer you to find out more in our publication and thank you for your watch. So thank you, Gal, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have some questions. So we have a first from Bill, Bill Phillips asking, uh, given that the BCS uh, BEC transition is smooth, why does one expect, at least initially, the polar mole molecule transition to be sharp? Uh, so thank you, Bill, for this question. Uh, the polar to molecule transition is actually a limiting case. If we consider a phase diagram where the, um, where the imbalance is one of the axes, then we know, of course, that the, BC, the balanced case of the BC-BCS crossover, we have this smooth transition. And the other thing we know that in the single impurity limit, we have this sharp transition. And in fact, the whole intermediate uh, area regime is kind of unknown, especially at high imbalances where we tend to the single impurity case, which we can analytically calculate. So that's actually what we are trying to prove. Okay, thank you. There's a second question from Bill. 
is asking if, is it obvious that the mass of the polaron is a well-defined constant and that it remains the same in a momentum transfer with Raman transition? Um, so thank you again for a great, great, great question. Uh, it is actually not a well-defined quantity and uh, a more uh, involved calculation actually shows that it's even not a co constant with respect to a constant uh, momentum. So it's actually a momentum dependent effective mass. However, we find that we can approximate the, the polar on mass to some constant variable. And using our theoretical model, we can verify our fitting technique of the experimental data uh, to be valid. Yeah, actually, we have a question on the chat from Luis asking if, uh, from your experimental protocol, can you extract results from the effective mass of both the polaron and the polaron mole molecule? Um, yes. So in our experimental protocol, we can extract the effective mass. In fact, the effective mass and the temperature, because of uh, the specific uh, experimental scheme, they are kind of highly uh, correlated parameters in our fi fitting routine. So we can either fit one of them. And in order to better extract the effective mass, what, what one should do, or what is uh, more uh, accurate to do, is actually inject uh, impurities at a desirable momentum. And then you can really pinpoint the whole branch in the dispersion. And this is actually what we intend to do. OK. There is a question, if you can say a, bit, a, bit, a little bit more about the high sensitivity uh, of, of your technique from where it comes from, it comes from better imaging or not? Uh, no, so in fact, the high sensitivity in our uh, experiment comes from the fact that we transfer the atoms after the Raman transition into another hyperfine uh, state of potassium, the atom that we use, which is magnetically trappable uh, while the, all the rest of the states are untrappable, and therefore we only keep the transferred atoms. Once we have them in a magnetic trap, we can switch on MOT beams and capture the fluorescence for a very long time, a second, say, and by this, really be able to probe them up to the, a very low, a very high resolution of a single atom. Thank you. Uh, another question, if you generalize the repulsive polarons, can you model just this in the same way and apply the same experimental techniques? Or are there particular complication in this case? In which case, sorry? Uh, rep repulsive polarons. Repuls so yeah, so the repulsive polaron is very interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, phenomenon. The issue with the repulsive polaron that it features a finite lifetime because it's the excited state in the dispersion. And therefore, you get a whole bunch of, of dynamic questions when you want to study it. So you need to come at the right timing because one, you want to study its dynamics. So you want to be fast enough. But on the other hand, you want to adiabatically slide into this channel. So actually, you need to really tune the, the right parameter regime in order to study it. So that, that is the major challenge in that case, I would say. Okay, thank you, Gal, again for your talk and the, your answer. And I leave again the, the word to Sebastian. Thank you also from my side. It's uh, great talks all around. So, uh, and the uh, third and final talk for today will be given by Martin Ringbauer from the uh, University of Innsbruck. Please, uh, Martin, if you want to share your slides and get started right away. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, and I'll join the others in thanking the organizers for the kind invitation. So I want to talk about a little challenge that we are facing with uh, quantum computers now that everyone can just go and buy themselves a, a fancy quantum computer, or at least time on some quantum computer. And these devices are starting to push into the regime where we uh, can't uh, check them classically anymore. So we have a bit of a challenge of finding ways to build trust in the output of these devices. And that's particularly true uh, for current near-term intermediate scale computers, uh, which won't have full error correction and which we know to be noisy, but still quite useful uh, if they perform as, as intended. Now, typical approaches for this uh, is to benchmark all the bits and pieces that go into this quantum computer. Uh, 
And then from that, try to extrapolate the performance of the full device. But that has some drawbacks because, for example, it doesn't capture things like crosstalk and correlated errors, which are quite prevalent in, in these current devices. Um, there are some other approaches that aim for verifying the, the whole thing uh, based on some uh, cryptographic ideas, uh, but they typically require some sort of quantum communication between devices or entanglement between multiple quantum computers, or they have very large overheads, uh, all not super practical for current devices. So we want to look at something uh, that gets away with fewer overheads. Um, and so our approach would be to uh, take a couple of these uh, noisy intermediate scale devices and uh, play them against each other to see if we can um, <clears throat> get some cross checks out of that. Now, before I uh, can talk about how this protocol really works, I need to uh, do a quick recap of uh, measurement-based quantum computing because that's the formal framework that we'll use uh, to derive uh, this, this cross-check procedure. So in measurement-based quantum computing, we start with some qubits in an equal superposition of zero and one. We entangle them with a controlled set gate, and then we keep doing that until we've built up a very large entangled state that is then the resource for our computation. And we don't want to do computation by applying unit trees. We want to do computation here by just measurements once we've built our, our cluster state. And the way we do this is we first define an input and an output of this cluster. Uh, and then we define a set of measurement angles. So all the measurements here will be in the XY plane of the blob sphere. Uh, so they're defined by a single angle. And so for each qubit, we define one of these measurement angles. And then we start measuring the first qubit. And what happens is that this teleports a quantum operation onto the subsequent qubit in, in that string. So in a bit more detail, if we have some arbitrary state on the first qubit and the original plus state on the second qubit, we do our measurement. Um, then we'll find the second qubit is now in a state psi with an operation applied to it. And that's this J alpha. Uh, this J gate is harder than a Z gate, which is a single qubit universal gate. Um, but that's only half the story because that's only true for measurement outcome zero. If the measurement outcome is one on the first qubit, then we'll have an extra uh, bit flip that we need to correct. But we can keep track of that and we can correct this in feed forward. Um, usually we wouldn't even apply this X, we would do something like this, where we pull it through the J gate and modify the angle of this gate by an extra pi. Um, and that takes care of this error accumulation. And then we keep measuring uh, our qubits until the end, and in the end uh, we'll have the result of our computation. Now to bring this back to something more familiar, like a circuit uh, picture, we can now just go through this cluster uh, in the way we would measure it and build up an equivalent circuit by starting with a Hadamard and a Z0, a CZ gate, applying some J gates and CZ, CZ and so on until we have our circuit. Um, and now there are a couple of uh, important things to note here that we will uh, need later. Um, so the intermediate outcomes, the, the measurement outcomes on all these intermediate qubits, uh, one to six here, they are uniformly random. That's because of the, the symmetry properties of this large entangled state we made in the beginning. Um, and the zero branch, where all of these measurement outcomes are zero for the intermediate measurements, this is what corresponds to this circuit. Uh, when one of these measurement outcomes is non-zero, then it still corresponds to this circuit, but with different angles for the single qubit gates. And these different angles are obtained by absorbing uh, the corrections that we would need to do for such non-zero outcomes. Um, and another thing to note here is when we draw this graph, so far we were reading the graph from left to right, and that gives us a circuit. Um, but we can also read it differently. Uh, we can read it from top to bottom. Uh, that gives us a different circuit. And in fact, you can find many ways to read this graph uh, that's called flow. The information flow through the graph is defined by your input and output set of qubits. And there are always for every graph, there are more in one choice like this. And it will give you circuits that uh, look very different. Um, they differ in, in input size, depth, structure, anything you could think of. But still, if you look at the output sets of these circuits, we see they overlap 
on here on qubit 8, depending on, on the flow, this might be more qubits. Um, but since they are derived from the same graph, from the same uh, cluster state, they must agree on the qubit where they overlap. And this is the trick that we want to use uh, to check uh, these, these circuits against each other. Um, <clears throat> and I have to say here before I get into the, the protocol, we're assuming that these devices are honest. Uh, so they, are, they might be faulty, but they're honest and they're not conspiring against us. Um, because the trick that we're using here, since these, these circuits look so different, also the error propagation will be very different. And the local error in one circuit will be a highly correlated error in the other circuit. Now, of course, you can trick this protocol if you conspire and if you uh, have correlations between the devices, but uh, we exclude that, that scenario for now. Okay, so how do we turn this into now a cross-check procedure? First thing we do is we pick a graph. Um, for the experiments we did, we picked this H-shaped graph um, and you choose two different flows through that graph, which gives you two different circuits. Then you pick a set of angles um, for the single qubit gates, including all the MBQC corrections for non-zero outcomes. That's all something that can be efficiently calculated classically uh, because of the graph structure of, of this problem. Then you could mask the angles and the outcomes if that's your thing. That's kind of a trick derived from, from blind quantum computing where you can apply stabilizer operators or random pie flips to, to hide these things. I'm not going to go into detail here. You can uh, look at that in the paper if you like. And then we sample from the outputs of uh, randomly chosen instances on these two circuits. So for each circuit, we have a set of angles that um, correspond to all these MBQC corrections. And we randomly choose a set of angles and sample from the device. And we run the two circuits, ideally on two different devices. In the experiment, we did this uh, with four architectures, with trapped ions, superconducting systems, photons, and NMR. Um, and then you want to compare uh, these devices against each other. So you need to estimate some sort of distance between the output distributions that you obtain from these two devices. Um, now, before I go into how these are scales and how to estimate the distance properly, I'll talk about something that is uh, not scalable. Um, it's just to give us a bit of an intuition what we can get out of this, because it's a very coarse measure if you just compare the two probability distributions. So we want to see what this can uh, give us. Here, for example, what we do is we take uh, a single device and run the two circuits on a single device. So on this graph, on the one axis, you have the outcomes, expectation values now for uh, certain output strings from the one circuit. And on the other axis, you have this, the same thing from the other uh, circuit. Now, this is a very small device, so we can actually calculate expectation values. Um, this is something we couldn't do on larger devices. But we see now each data point here is a different instance of the circuit. So a circuit with different angles. Um, and they should always lie on the 45 degree line if the two circuits agree with each other. So that's a way to self-test kind of our device because we do in some sense the same calculation in two very different ways. Uh, so it's very unlikely that uh, we'd make the same mistakes. Um, and uh, now, of course, we can do the same thing on different devices. And we've done this on, on a couple of devices, always running circuits of different size. Now, one thing, of course, you see that these devices differ very largely in the system and the statistical errors, uh, which is given by the error bar on each data point. But then you can also see some scatter around the 45 degree line, which indicates some sort of coherent uh, systematic error. Or you see some tilting of the line, which indicates some decoherence on, on one of the devices. But so this is just for illustration purposes. So we can get a feeling for uh, what this method can show us. Now we want to do something more scalable. So we don't want to estimate the output distribution because that scales exponentially in the, in the size of the output Hilbert space. Um, it's enough for us to estimate a distance between the distributions. And this is what we use is uh, the squared L2 distance between these vectors P1 and P2. Now these vectors are the probabilities of obtaining certain measurement strings from the combined output set of the two circuits. Now, since 
these output sets are overlapping but not identical, that means every circuit has to sample output strings that it can't actually obtain from its own output. Um, and to get this data, we sample over multiple instances of the circuit because uh, the non-output qubits for each circuit are uniformly random distributed. So by just picking the angles corresponding to some other outputs on the intermediate measurements, we can actually sample this whole uh, vector on, on each device. And now to estimate this, we decompose it into uh, these three terms. The first and the last term is estimated just on a single device. And again, here, we make use of the fact that uh, non-output uh, non qubits are uniformly random. So we don't actually have to do any sampling here. We can just stick with one circuit and do the estimation there. Um, <clears throat> and then essentially what we want to find here is the probability of obtaining the same output string twice, right? the collision between, between output strings. And that we know from the birthday paradox scales as two to the uh, Hilbert space size half. Um, so significantly better than uh, trying to estimate the full thing. Uh, so that's that's the easy part. Now the tricky bit is estimating this uh, cross term here. So that's the collision probability between output strings on the one device and on the other device. So here we really have to now sample over multiple instances on each device um, to construct this full probability vector to get all the, the measurement strings in the combined output. And by the same argument as before, this scales as two to the uh, Hilbert space size half, which is still smaller than the number of output qubits on the larger circuit. And uh, of course, this is exponential. That's why I say it's, it's more scalable than the previous approach. Um, but depending on, on your problem, this might actually scale quite favorably if you have a lot of qubits in common between the circuits. Uh, then this exponent gets smaller. Also, if your probability distribution is rather peaked, then this gets also more efficient. So this is really kind of a worst case uh, scenario here. And still it's better than sampling from the larger circuit directly. All right, so now just quickly uh, looking at experimental data. So we've done comparisons between five devices um, and you get always pairwise comparisons estimating this uh, squared L2 norm. Um, and you see here with the color coding, the darker uh, lines indicate better agreement, the lighter lines integrate, uh, integrate, indicate worse agreement. Um, so you get kind of a feeling uh, which devices uh, perform better here. Uh, now we shouldn't look too much at the numbers here. These were kind of first generation older devices. They will all perform much better nowadays. Um, but just to get a feeling for, for the method. And then now that we've done all these comparisons, we can in fact also uh, try to get an idea about the, the absolute performance of a single device by averaging over all comparisons we've done. Um, and when we do that, we see that qualitatively, uh, we get a ranking of the devices that agrees with the theory expectation from comparing this uh, squared L2 norm to the theory prediction. Again, something we couldn't do in a large device, but here we can to, to see what's happening. And we see we get qualitative agreement here. So by averaging the squared L2 norm over multiple comparisons, we can get a feeling about the absolute performance of the device. Of course, we cannot expect to get quantitative agreement here just because uh, once there is a, a device that uh, where the difference is quite large, then this uh, increases these values immediately. All right, and with that, I'd like to thank all the, the co-authors for a great collaboration here, and I'm happy to take questions. Very good, thank you so much for the talk, Martin. Um, so we have a um, first question, which is quite general. So every community and even research group seems to have their own way of comparing quantum devices so that they all look particularly good. Can you say a bit more about what the most fair comparison is? It's your fair or not? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. And um, there have been some papers showing that, that different devices have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and uh, certainly here we have 
a nice advantage that we can uh, look at these two different circuits. And when you think of uh, internal verification of a device, uh, you will typically have a circuit that is, has many qubits and the other circuit will have fewer qubits and, and be a very deep circuit. So that tends to play into different strengths of a device. Um, but otherwise we, we don't have any, any assumptions on the devices here. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to say if that plays into the strength of any, any particular device. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Bill Phillips. I mean, have I understood correctly that you have a method for checking a circuit-based quantum computer that uses insight gain from thinking about a measurement-based quantum computer? Yeah, I think that's a good way of thinking about it. So um, the measurement-based quantum computing gives us the, the background structure, the connection between uh, these two circuits. Um, yeah. Okay, we have another question. So you have talked about how these measurements scale with the size of the Hilbert space. Is there also an important dependence on the relative error and how large the distance between the distribution is? Uh, it means that it's this method better worse for detection when the device are very close or very different? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, we haven't particularly looked in detail into that, but uh, the method itself is not sensitive to the underlying probability distribution. Uh, that's very nice. But of course, um, what you see, uh, and I mentioned that briefly, is uh, that it performs better in terms of scaling when your distribution is rather peaked. So as the devices get very noisy, the distribution gets less peaked. So you tend to take more samples to get, um, get an estimate of this, this number. Okay, thank you very much, Martin, again. So I, again, leave, leave the stage for Sebastian. Well, thank you, everybody. This was, and thank you, Martin, for a great talk as well, of course. And uh, thanks to all, uh, all you three uh, for giving very good talks and staying perfectly on time. This is the first. So um, I'd like, again, I uh, also would like to thank all the people who submitted their proposals for uh, giving a talk here. And we're, we are very seriously considering doing another Young Researcher session soon. Um, we will tell you more about that in the upcom upcoming weeks. And uh, next week on November 12th, we will have Mariana Safronova who will speak about something very different again. She'll talk about uh, dark matter searches using atomic and nuclear clocks. If you wanna know and get notified of what we do, please go to our website, uh, quantumscienceseminar.com, subscribe to our email list or Google calendar, follow us on Twitter. And you should certainly check out our sister seminar, the AMO seminar, where tomorrow they will have Thomas Weinacht uh, speaking about coherent control of dynamics in molecules. If you want to join us for a Q&A session, you have more questions for our speakers today, please dial in with the uh, Zoom link that I just pasted into the YouTube chat window. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest and we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. Bye. <laughs>